So anyways, just want to welcome everyone again to this district hall space. We are so thrilled to be partnering with uh, URI and the Coastal Resources Center for this fourth edition of um, the kind of the online Baird Symposium webinar series. And this one's titled Effects on the Food Web. We are going to hear presentations from Andrew Gill and Jennifer Dunahim. Um, and we're also going to have uh, bring in George Maynard and Dave Stevenson to be included in the conversation and moderated by Elizabeth Mithrata and, of course, Jen McCann. And with that, I'll pass it over to Jen McCann of the URI Coastal Resources Center and Rhode Island Sea Grant. Great. Thanks, everyone. Um, thanks for, for joining us um, today. Um, as you know, learning as we go. And um, again, as Avi mentioned, um, the focus of this uh, of this webinar is um, the effects on the food web. And I just wanted to, uh, this is the fourth webinar. We have one more um, of this from the series. And the, the topics are selected, have been selected because we went out and we talked to you guys and we asked you, what do you need to know? So Fred Mater, I see you there. Um, we sat down with you and asked you, what do you want to know about? What are some of your issues and concerns? So um, because of COVID, um, we now have uh, a lot more stakeholders who are interested in these topics, which is exciting. And, and one reason why we, um, Rhode Island Sea Grant, Dennis Nixon is online, our director, um, is because, you know, in, as many of you know, um, Rhode Island has the, the, first, um, the first offshore wind farm. And um, we started asking questions about offshore wind in 2007 and 2008. And um, this past January, I went to a, a BOEM meeting about um, the Gulf of Maine and offshore wind there. And I was very surprised at how many questions that were being asked there um, that we were asking in 2008. And so um, as a university, as Sea Grant, um, we felt that it was important to begin to create a forum or a momentum on how can we learn from each other, um, learn as we go. And um, we're so excited to be able to, um, to partner with, with ICES, which is the International Council for the Exploration of the Seas, um, here, their working group on the benthic environment and offshore wind and bringing that expertise um, from Europe, not to say that the Europeans have all the answers. I, we know that they, you guys don't, but you've been studying this a lot longer than we have. And it's a real opportunity to really learn as we go. So again, we are partnering with ICES, the working group on marine benthal and renewable energy development. Um, and also, we really appreciate working with Venture Cafe and District Hall uh, for your innovativeness and also your um, ability to reach out to other sectors in the community that we are not. Um, before we start, um, Carrie Hitt, I know you're here. Um, we, um, Carrie is the Executive Director for the National Offshore Wind Research and Development Consortium. We've asked her to just to um, welcome you um, from New York and to did you want to say just a couple of words about who you are and what you're doing oh that's very sweet of you to let me go first thank you so much can you hear me okay yes great so first I'm actually in Massachusetts not too far from Providence oh, okay. um, yeah that's where I live and work but um, we do a lot of work in New York as well and just very quickly I'm sure some of you um, heard about us but not everyone we're the um, I run the National Offshore Wind Research and Development Consortium, which is a national organization uh, funded in part by uh, DOE, Department of Energy, uh, NYSERDA, and a few other states um, across the country. And uh, what we do is, with that funding is award research projects in the offshore wind space that accelerate deployment. So we're very focused on technology, however, so innovation and in technology in offshore wind. Um, hardware, uh, a little bit of strategy uh, sometimes um, comes through the awards as well. Um, we ran a um, major solicitation last year. We've made 20 awards totaling around $17.5 million. We have a solicitation open right now for approximately $9 million in three different challenge areas. Again, all focused on offshore wind. 
and we will run another solicitation at some point in 2021 as well um, on similar topics. So we have a website. Uh, I encourage you to go take a look at it if you're interested in these topics or providing a proposal. Proposals can come from research, academic institutions, private entities, small entities, large entities, um, any variety. No one is um, precluded from applying uh, for an award. It is a competitive solicitation, however. So the current one is open at the moment. Um, we have three rounds. One just closed this week. There'll be two more rounds that close in October. So um, if you are interested, take a look soon and um, happy to answer questions via email if people have any questions. Thanks Thank so much. Thanks, Carrie. And maybe if you could put that link right in the chat room, that, that would be greatly appreciated. I'll do so, that right now. Thank thanks. you. I know you have a packed agenda, so thanks. Great. So um, um, we know her formally as Elizabeth, but her we call her informally Lisa. So Lisa, um, I'm going to um, push it over to you if you want to introduce yourself and if you could talk about for you, what is the value of this topic? Why is this topic important, not only for you professionally, but also for the region? Absolutely. Uh, thank you, Jen. And good morning, everyone. Uh, my name is Elizabeth Mathrata, although everyone calls me Lisa, as Jen pointed out. Um, I'm a fisheries biologist working at the Northeast Fisheries Science Center, where I support um, the offshore wind team, uh, working on a variety of topics uh, related to uh, the biological interactions and, and fisheries management uh, issues related to offshore wind development uh, in the region. Um, I think this topic of, of food web effects is actually a really uh, interesting and, and important topic um, because if you think about it, you know all the organisms in our in our ecosystem from microbes and fish and algae and, and even turtles and marine mammals, they're all really linked together through their feeding or their or their trophic relationships and you know understanding those linkages, those feeding linkages between organisms at wind farms can help us to understand the impact of, of wind farms on both the patterns and processes at the sort of local scale that is at the turbine level and the wind farm level, um, but also the regional and, and ecosystem level scale. Um, the, the relationships, these feeding relationships um, and the effects that offshore wind may have on them, um, I think it's important because they, they have important implications for um, empirical research and monitoring, so it can help us um, identify what species or species groups might be sort of more sensitive to offshore wind development, and um, those might be the ones we might want to focus some of our investigations on. Um, these effects are important from a modeling perspective. It can help us develop and refine our predictive models to be able to make predictions over both spatial landscapes and, and temporal scales as well. Um, and of course, it's also uh, it has these effects have important implications from a, from a fisheries perspective. That is, you know, it'll help us, um, if we can understand some of these interactions with the food web, you know, it can help us understand uh, the potential changes in the distribution of an abundance of fisheries, of fisheries resources. And of course, because of that, it is tied closely to fisheries management as well. Um, so food web effects uh, from offshore wind development um, really touches on all of these things and, and as someone who works at the interface of, of fisheries science and fisheries management, um, these topics are of particular interest uh, to me um, personally and professionally. Um, so for all of those reasons, um, I'm just really happy to have uh, Jennifer and um, Andrew here to speak with us today and I'm, I'm really looking forward to their presentations and um, the conversations that follow. So I'll uh, Pass it back to you, Jen. I think uh, I'm really yep. excited for our talks today. Beautiful, thank you. George, do you want to quickly introduce, tell us who you are? Sure, uh, my name is George Menard. I'm the uh, research coordinator at the Cape Cod Commercial Fishermen's Alliance. We're a nonprofit uh, working on behalf of small, small boat owner operator vessels, uh, primarily in southeastern Massachusetts. Um, most of the folks I work with are fixed gear fishermen. Um, so for those of you who aren't in the industry or familiar with that term, uh, that means gear that's left in place as opposed to gear that's uh, dragged along the bottom. Um, I'm also uh, was recently appointed to the advisory panel for the Responsible Offshore Science Alliance. Uh, and that's sort of uh, an industry-based group uh, looking to provide better information um, and monitoring of uh, offshore wind developments and their effects on the ecosystem. 
Thank you, George. And um, we have David, who who is a diehard uh, person who's following all the rules, and he's sitting in his car. <laughs> so can you introduce yourself? I'm sitting in the car in front of the public library and using their Wi-Fi. Oh. <laughs> yeah, I'm David Stevenson. I work for the National Marine Fisheries Service uh, Regional Office in Gloucester, Massachusetts. I actually live in Maine, uh, which is where I am now. Uh, we do mostly more regulatory related work with wind development, um, assessing impacts of construction and operation on uh, fish habitat. And that's primarily my, my role in the, uh, in the environmental assessments for, for wind energy. We can leave it at that. Great, thank you. Um, Jenny, do you wanna introduce yourself? Yes, my name is Jenny Dunham. I'm senior scientist at the Alfred Wegener Institute for Polar and Marine Research in, in Bremerhaven in Germany. I'm a benthic ecologist by training and uh, work a lot on functional ecology of benthis. Uh, I'm working on offshore wind farm effects now for around about 10 years um, and focusing um, partly on, on food web effects. Um, I have been sharing together with Andrew the um, working group for marine bands and renewable energy development in ICES for six years. Um, and I'm working together with a regulatory um, office here in Germany, um, collecting all the data from the environmental impact assessments from offshore wind farms here, because in Germany we put them all together in databases, data information system, and we use this data information system to look at large scale effects and cumulative effects. So there's a close link between the, the, the regulatory side here and science, what we do here. Great, thank you. And, and Andrew Gill? Hi, good morning, everyone. Yes, Andrew Gill. Um, I'm essentially an applied fish fisheries ecologist. Um, I've been working on offshore renewable energy since <laughs> a long time now, nearly 20 years, um, particularly interested in the, in the, the ecological perspective of things. I've been writing about that as well uh, um, and it's good to, to be able to talk about um, data and, and information coming from some of the, the, the work that's uh, right across the, 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 the uh, Europe that we've been uh, um, working on. Uh, I currently, I, I spent most of my life in academia but I recently, about a year and a half ago, joined CFAS, the Centre for Environment, Fisheries and Aquaculture Science in the UK and we are essentially are a scientific advisory um, group to our UK government's Department of Environment um, and I'm heading up the sort of offshore renewable energy um, development and support um, that we're giving and advice and assessment on that um, given the amount of, of uh, enabling action we're doing for offshore wind over here uh, around the coast of the UK. Great thank you thanks Andrew and um I'm not, I'm, just, I'm not asking you to say anything, but we have Andy Lipsky, who's going to be our silent moderator over in the chat room. So if you need a clarification question, looking for more research, Andy is gonna um, monitor the chat room um, extensively. So I'm gonna pass this over to Jenny and Andrew to um, uh, give your presentations, your tandem presentations. Okay, so probably I'll uh, start off. I should also say on behalf of Andy Lipsky that Andy Lipsky, myself, and a colleague in Germany, Antje Gimpel, are co-chairs of an IC's working group on offshore wind development fisheries. Sorry, I should have said that. The, um, the idea here is uh, Jenny and I have worked together, like we said, on IC's working groups, and a lot of the uh, research that's conducted over here has, by definition, needed to be across boundaries, so not just within countries, but across countries. And there's nothing as, as good as thinking about it from a food web perspective, because the evidence base and the, the knowledge that we've gained, and we're still a long way off it, as Jenny says, we still haven't got all the answers at all. But the evidence that we're building has only come about because of collaboration and working together. Um, and so Jenny and I thought it would be a good idea to do the same with this talk. So, so um, as I said, we decided to do this together because there's nothing better than to um, talk about food webs and the interlinks and the connectedness that um, Lisa talked about, uh, we thought we'd do it together in this talk. So I'm going to start off giving some sort of context and food for thought, 
and then I'll hand over to Jenny uh, and then she'll hand back to me and then we'll round up a little bit later on. So sit back and uh, get your coffee, your tea, whatever you've got and hopefully we can uh, illustrate some of the interesting um, aspects that are coming from studying food webs. So this diagram here, just take you, I'm going to take you for a dip in the early morning over in the US. Um, on the left hand side, we have a picture of, you know, the kind of environment we might expect in terms of the water, clear water environment, sandy seabed, which is where we might be thinking of putting our offshore wind farm, which is depicted on the right hand side. I'm going to take away this picture and sort of break this down. And there's two, two slides, which is food for thoughts to set the context for what Jenny and I are talking about. And it's thinking about the change to the ecosystem. So we're, we're trying to understand, we've put these things in the water, what could be the changes? And then we're going to try and illustrate some of those through the, the research that's been done. So the first one here is about potential habitats and physical factors that may change. So here, this is just very straightforward. We have obviously the surface, the seabed, the magic zone. That's just a, a the, the picture I just showed you. And so we have currents moving, we have tide, tidal movement, and we have eddies in two different regions. If we then put in a, either a monopile or a jacket structure, which is on the right hand side, then you can hypothesize that the situation is that you get some changes to the current, because the current has to go around the hard structure, particularly a monopile. And we know that the evidence for that comes from things like scour uh, occurring behind a monopile. Um, we've also got, interestingly, now we've got a hard substrate within the whole water column. And we now have a tidal zone in the top. That's an interesting element which changes the, the, the system. And particularly at the bottom, we have um, essentially a sort of scour protection to reduce the effects of the, of the, the currents and the tides. And that's usually a very you know, hard, hard substrate, which is in a sandy environment. So basically we're getting a change, a physical change to a, a hydrodynamic change to environment, which we um, with consequences for the different elements of the ecosystem. So bearing that in mind, we move to the next slide, which is, is thinking about that ecosystem. I have a particular interest in fish, so there's a lot of fish slides here, but obviously um, we're not just talking about on the left hand side we have what we might expect is we've got pelagic fish and we've got predators shown by the top photograph which is a typical photograph in the British seas at this time of year, not. Um, and at the bottom we have a demersal fish feeding off the sandy seabed. Now we can depict that in a sort of more sort of academic conventional term in relation to the types of um, components of the ecosystem. And this diagram, very simple really, is just looking at the components, which are the boxes or the white circles, telling you the components of the, of the ecosystem. Um, and the, the circles, the gray circles, represent a relative biomass, the amount, the abundance, and the, and the, 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 the different elements, such as the benthos, the demersal fish, all the way up. And the arrows, the black arrows, indicate um, connection, which we call trophic connection, which is energy connection. And the different size of the, of the arrows represents the strength. So that's a, that's a prediction we can say that we expect based on our understanding of ecosystems that may occur. If we then go to the right hand side, you can see a picture of a wind farm and sand eels. We've got bivalve mussel growth on the structure. And then in the scour protection, we have some growth and some, some uh, crustacean and, and uh, cnidarians on the, on the, 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 um, the scour. We might expect a change to that picture that was on the left hand side. And the main things here to look at are the number of categories. So we've got you know, the, the predators and the pelagic fish and the plankton and the size of the gray circles. We'd expect them to be, to be bigger. And for instance, the false one at the bottom, we expect it to be bigger because of just this structure. And that's what Jenny's gonna talk about very soon. And so the idea is that we're looking at a slightly changed, we think there's a slightly changed ecosystem here and the connections may change and the strength of those connections may change. And that's really sort of driving the sort of, I suppose, the theory understanding of how energy is passed through the system and how the system may respond. And if we're interested, say, in the fish side of things, then we might expect the demersal fish to be bigger because we presume they might associate with the structures. They may be, uh, f find refuge there from predators or refuge from fishing, for instance. And we also have an interaction with uh, the littoral zone at the top as well. So with that context in mind, what we want to try and do is say, well, is there, what's the evidence we have currently to try and support this kind of trophic connectivity and sort of abundance change that we might expect? Okay, that's 
So it's a journey in Germany, Block Island Road, uh, Block Island Wind Farm. And Jay, I'll stop sharing and then you can take. Okay, so I will take on um, from this and talk about the lower trophic level, level so the smaller critters um, in the benthos. Um, and this is work carried out by me and numerous colleagues, particularly from the Insight and DINA project, the International Project, and the ISIS Working Group on Marine Bantha and Renewable Energy Developments. So, what are the changes um, by offshore wind farms um, to the benthos? And there are major, um, three major interactions principally leading to food web changes. So one is <clears throat> that the cessation of active trawling, if trawl is banned from the offshore wind farm area, has consequences for the food web within the area and has potential spillover effects. And this is what I depicted here uh, at the lower bottom, that you see, uh, you can see the German exclusive economic zone in the North Sea. Then you see the, um, the wind farm area and in Germany, the, the uh, turbines are kind of 900 to one kilometer apart from each other. Uh, so that's a on a larger scale. That's one, one change um, by offshore wind farms. The second two um, interactions are related to the artificial reef effect that Andrew just introduced. So there's addition of hard substrate and new species as additional food sources available. And um, we have organic enrichment around the turbines um, by the increased organic material available for the soft uh, substrate communities. And that you can see here in this picture on the right hand side. So you have the turbine that's colonized by um, organism, the fowling community, you have as a nation, so you have different um, animals at the lower part of the structure than at the upper part of the structure. And these species might become available as new prey items for, um, for um, megafauna, for example, fish or crabs. At the same time, <coughs> in the upper part of the structure, for example, you'll find a lot of mussels. Um, and then you have um, organic matter falling down, that means um, excretion from the muscles, for example. But also, if you think about this box of muscle and wind and waves at the upper part of the structure, so um, muscle blocks will fall down. And this is biomass export to the surrounding and leads to a potential organic enrichment. So that changes also the sub substrate um, <coughs> and, and the, uh, the food web. Okay. So you see already from the first slide that there are different scales you can look at uh, offshore, um, uh, wind farm effects on, on any kind of, um, of um, change uh, and also in, in food web changes. So on the spatial scale, you have the turbine related um, effects. You can, um, the wind array um, related effects, more regional effects. And you also have a temporal scale. So you have construction effects for offshore wind farms operational effects and dismantling or decommissioning effects. And I will uh, mainly focus on the operational effects today. Before we start with offshore wind farm effects on the benthos, just a quick introduction into food web ecology. So when, if you want to know, um, analyze food webs, there are two major components. One is the structural parts. So you need to know the components and the links. This is, for example, that the whole food web in most marine systems starts with a phytoplankton, small algae, that is the, the base um, for, for many, many of where the food web is based on as an energy source. So many of these small critters in the benthos, like worms, bivalves, and crustaceans, or sea urchin, are feeding directly on these organic algae as organic matter. And those are themselves, again, benthic prey items to higher trophic levels, such as cod, for example, or crabs, and the cod is uh, food for the seal, and the seal is food for the shark. And you can even measure this, this, this heights, the trophic hierarchy in the food web, and their met methods to get kind of some kind of structuring. So now you know the different, the, the components, the species, and how they're um, linked to each other. And just to keep it simple here, the second thing, you know how they are linked, but you don't know if the cod, for example, is more feeding on the bivalve or more feeding on the crabs. So what you want to know is the size of the energy flow between the species. And this is the second part that is um, important. So how much energy does the cod get, for example, from, from the bivalve or from the crab? And this can be measured by benthic production. This is something that um, um, explains how much energy is turned into biomass. And it's the energy available for the higher trophic levels. Um, and it's usually expressed in gram carbon or kilojoule. And this is what I just said with the biomass and the cod. 
So if you see the lower picture here, you have the consumption and the energy going into the organism from the bivalve here, and the bivalve assimilates <coughs> the energy. Some energy got lost by excretion and respiration because the, the bivalve has to breathe. Some go into reproduction, and the rest of the energy that is available goes into growth. So it's growth building up more body mass for one species or growth of a whole population. And this is what we call secondary production, where you can measure the energy flow then between species. Okay, what changes and how much changes in the lower tropic levels? <clears throat> I want to ask, answer here four questions. The first question is how much extra biomass do we get uh, implementing these turbines, this artificial hard substrate on naturally um, soft sediment? The second question is how much energy is potentially exported from the turbines to the surrounding? And if so, is production increased in the soft bottom? And all these three questions are related to the artificial reef effect on a local scale. And then I will focus as a last step on a, on a bit wider scale, that's the orange one, what effects has fishery cessation on the benthos? So let's start with the first question, how much extra biomass is there on the pile? This is a study that we carried out in the first wind farm in Germany, and you see on the x-axis here the time of sampling over three years, and on the y-axis you see the biomass in kilogram per square meter. And we tested this for uh, two different um, structure types, tripods and jacket structure. And for both, <coughs> for both structures, you see an increase in biomass, particularly in the first meters. So this is related to uh, some species, mainly the blue mussels and some amphipods, while the lower biomass is dominated, for example, by antizoons, and that's what I meant with azonation. So in the upper part, the blue mussel contributes around about 96% to the biomass while in 10 meters, that was only 5%. Uh, and we did that on a larger scale, taking together all wind farms, different wind farms in the Belgian Sea, Dutch waters, and in the German waters. And look, and we found the same pattern here. What you see here on the lower graph is uh, on the x-axis, the uh, sampling depth around along the turbine. So here's the sea surface at zero and I'm down to 30 meters. And on the y-axis, you have now the production in gram carbon per square meter per year. And what you see here is that the production is highest in the upper part and then decreasing to the lower part of the structure. So there's more energy available at the upper part of the structure. So how much is that? And we calculated in a recent a paper what we want to publish that the hard substrate production, the energy that gets available or is produced is around 300 carbons while the natural soft substrate is just four gram carbon. So the production at the turbines is 80 times higher than the natural surrounding. So how much of this energy is then exported? And you can simply calculate that by, by a simple model. So just think that you go out as, as, at the first sampling time and measure the biomass, the weight of the blue mussels, for example, here. And then you know until the second sampling time that these mussels are growing. So I have production from time one to time two. So the, grow, the, the growth and the biomass stock should end up in the biomass of the second sampling. If you have less biomass, then something is exported from the structure to the surrounding. If you have more biomass, then something from the external system um, has, has been settled on the, on the turbine. For example, if you have new recruitment of new species, then you have a gain. And we calculated this for all the wind farms in the southern North Sea. And we found the highest variability and loss uh, at the upper part of the structures, so where the blue mussels are, and of the oldest community. And this is logic because if you think that the, the, the population of blue mussels is growing and growing, and then you have wind and waves, for example, in the autumn, then the older the community is, the more biomass you have, the more is the risk that something is going to the surrounding. And we found, found an annual loss, a consequent loss from the piles of 200 gallons per square meters. So how much is that? That's uh, an annual loss of 71% of the standing crop of the turbine. So this is exported from the surrounding during the year, from the turbines to the surrounding during one year. So how much is much? And I just want to give you an example of upscaling this energy export. So for the German wind farm, the first one, Alpha Ventos, we calculated loss of uh, around about 450 gram carbon because sometimes it's hard to capture, I converted it 
just in weight weight, so weight what you can measure. So just think about five kilos of blue muscles per square meter per year. If you upscale that to a, to a normal turbine, you get a weight on uh, an export to the surrounding from the turbine of 1.2 tons. And if in Germany, we have at the moment around about 1,500 turbines in the water. So this means an export of 1,760 tons. And Germany wants by 2040 to install up to um, 8,600 turbines. That would mean that there's an export of 10,000 tons of biomass that haven't been there before to the surrounding. So is that much? That, that depends on the scale that you're looking at. Because if you look around the turbine, it's an increase of production that is our energy available of 26%. At a wind farm scale, let's say like with 40 turbines, 30 square kilometers, it's just 0.3%. And if you look at the German exclusive economic zone, it's just an increase with 9,000 turbines of 0.06%. So this can be easily calculated, the production impact, uh, if you know how much is exported and how much the, how large the production is in the soft bottom surrounding. And we found by a model um, calculating the production impacted area that an increase of 5% um, has only an effect up to 150 meters from the pile on the soft substrate. So it's a local effect. And we tested that again focusing on a larger scale, comparing the wind farm area, the array area, with the control site, which has the same environmental setting, so from the Baki design, and for, with increasing distance to the turbine. And what we found is that there are no significant changes with distance, with large distance, and the sub substrate production changes were within the natural range. So it's the, the production um, differences between control and wind farm area well, let's say, for example, like within the seasonal changes. Okay. What Jennifer, also, sorry. May I break in and ask, this is David, may I ask you a question? Yeah. Uh, a lot of the wind farms that are going to be built on the Northeast US here are going to be, well, not a lot of them, some of them are going to be built in areas with uh, some hard substrate. Would you expect this export of energy to surrounding substrates to be significantly different than it would be for soft substrates? It depends on if you have hard substrate. Hard substrate production in general is higher than soft substrate. So the, the difference between if you have hard substrate surrounding would not be as huge as, for example, for soft substrate. Because in, in general, hard substrates, artificiaries, natural reefs have higher production values not as high as the turbines, there will definitely be a difference, but the difference um, to, to putting them into soft substrate will be, will be different, yes. Thank you. Yeah? Okay. So despite from, from, the, from the production effect or the local effect of production, we have uh, also a change in sediment condition. I just want to depict that here quickly. On the left side, you see uh, a typical soft bottom or um, fine sand community. On the right side of this picture, this brown, brownish ones, you see a lot of shell depress and so on. That's around an offshore wind turbine. So you not only have, um, um, you have also changes in the granulometry. So that means that the sediment is getting coarser in a way. And not all species like that because they like fine sand and not coarse sand. So you change the community structure of the species sitting into, in the sediment as well. Okay. And as a fourth question, I had the food response to fishing cessation. And I did a study um, uh, around a research platform some years ago, the FINA research platform, for instance, the German, uh, German bite. And around the platform, fishing was not allowed within a radius of 500 meters. And we compared that to further on trawled areas. And we looked at the food web structure and the trophic level and the energy flow. And I just want to summarize the outcomes of this. So what we found in the unfished area is that the, that the energy flow, the production of predators and scavengers was lower and also the trophic level was lower. You, you, might, you remember this trophic hierarchy, what, what I just um, explained in the beginning. And this is because there's less food in the, less food in the unfished area because they're, they're lacking the discard and the bycatch. And so these scavengers living on that bycatch were migrating out of the area. 
In delta feeders, those that feed um, plankton, algae, phytoplankton from the water color, we didn't find any shifts in the food web um, or in the structure, what, neither nor in trophic level, neither in energy flow. For the interface feeders, we found a higher production. Interface feeders are those ones that can switch between um, filter feeding, so feeding from the water column, or deposit feeding, feeding from the sea, uh, sea bottom. And we think that this is because these are small worms often living in tubes, that there's a strong, there was a stronger settlement of those because there was less physical um, stress by, by the missing active um, uh, crawling gears. And deposit feeders had a higher trophic level, and this because the biogeochemistry in the sediment changed, and thus the trophic level of these species depending on the organic matter in the sediment. <clears throat> so in summary, um, just to pick the, the different scales in the beginning, what I introduced, um, I just, um, I just um, explained here that there's uh, 80 times higher biomass on the pile that 71% uh, of this extra biomass or production is um, exported to the surrounding, but that there were no significant changes um, further away than 150 meters. So the question is, if we don't see this higher production in the surrounding, then this energy that becomes available must be, um, must be eaten up directly by predators. And the question is how much that is. And uh, until now, there are no studies. The changes in the food web structure and energy flow are visible from fishery exclusion. <clears throat> and this is because the, the, this is a potential for the, the benthos to recover in this wind farm areas if they are, um, um, if they are closed for, fishes, for fishing. You have to remember that if you have food web structure, it's like, I like the, 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 the picture of the Jenga game. So you have a tower and the players successfully take away the bricks and parts and place them on top on the structure until it becomes unstable and crashes. So each part can thus be a keystone or several um, key stones can replace one keystone, for example, um, to keep the stability and can be maintained. And that's the same for the food web. If you remove species or the added species or you change the energy flow between species, you're changing the, the, the dimensions of the, of the bricks, such as in the Jenga game. Okay, so as I have shown, most of the results here in my talk are from, from the turbine or the wind array um, scale. And this is because most of the research programs are uh, running on this scale. So there are some modeling studies on, more regional, um, on a regional scale, on a larger scale. And I just want to give you one example from the blue mussels where German colleagues um, modeled that these blue mussels on the turbine, which are filter feeders, they can reduce the primary production up to 8%. And you see here the relative change in percent in the, in the um, wind farm areas that are planned in the German bind. So it's really important not to have this, this local effects um, on the turbine and wind farm scale, but think bigger. And even if you think about international large scale studies, what you see here, the, the colored areas are the wind farm areas and black dots are the oil and gas rigs in the North Sea. So we have a lot of um, artificial hard substrates out there and we're putting more structures in. So the question is, for example, if these um, hard substrate or artificial substrate can connect natural hard, sub, uh, hard substrate to these artificial ones. And because mobile, the, the smaller benthic animals are not very mobile, but they are mobile by their larva distribution and dispersal by currents. And then the artificial structures can be used as stepping stones for range expansion or non-native species. So it's on a way you bring new species in, you're playing Jenga again, and you don't know what the consequences are. So we need more studies definitely at the ecosystem level, international level. And some, some of these um, will be part of the next talk and I'm handling, uh, yeah, sorry, I forget that. So you're connecting and potentially changing local food web, but maybe I've uh, said that. So, and Andrew will um, talk about this a little bit more. So I'm handing over to the next trophic levels. Right, thanks very much, Jenny. <clears throat> Fantastic, starting with the, with the lower tropic levels. So you're familiar with this, this diagram I showed you before. So Jenny has dealt with the 
organisms that are uh, utilizing the new hard substrates, not just at the bottom there, but all up the, the column. Jenny's done the bottom part, looking at the benthos uh, and the hard sub substrate um, connection and demonstrated there's, a, there's a, a, a big difference there in relation to soft sediments. So we're gonna have a look at some of the evidence relating to the hydrotropic levels. Okay, <clears throat> one thing because we're talking about food webs and we're talking about ecological effects is that it's not just about the habitat change that's occurred. There are other things going on that may influence the hydrotropic levels that are there. And here's a, a diagram of a summary of things to demonstrate that we may have things like underwater noise that might change the occurrence. Electromagnetic field is something that you'll hear about both in the future bird symposium, so I won't talk about these, but they are things we need to consider about the wind farm itself, the habitat gain possibility, and then there's fisheries exclusion. So this is going to have influences on those hydrotropic levels, which are essentially sort of co-variables with this. The other side of things we have to think about, as Jenny mentioned, is the spatial scale. And she mentions this diagram here illustrates it quite nicely with the concentric circles, showing that, uh, supporting what Jenny has demonstrated with the evidence that the close into the turbines, we have these changes. But when we're talking about hyotrophic levels, they, they generally are more mobile organisms. So the, potentially the, the influence that may, the, the turbines may have may actually cross over from one turbine to another, which is these, these crossing over um, concentric circles. So again, what kind of evidence do we have relating to that? And then if we scale even further, here's the um, existing or or renewable development in the uh, in Europe, Northern Europe, and we need to be thinking about this scale because a number of the organisms, in particularly in the higher trophic levels, but also a number of the benthic species that have dispersal reproduction, are potentially going to interact with wind farms at some point in their uh, in their, their their life cycle and at some point spatially. Now this is important because that's to, to understand to change the food web, we need to be thinking about that. So you have your five turbines at Block Island at the moment, and yes, you're, you've seen changes. There's some good evidence that you've, um, that's been published recently showing the changes. However, what you're more interested in in terms of food webs is this wider scale, which is very similar to what's going on in Europe and other parts of the world now, where there's going to be many more turbines and you need to be thinking about the ecological factors that may influence the organisms that are there. And then the other side of it is the existing substrate. So Jenny made soft substrate, and the question that came from Dave was about hard substrate. That's an element that you need to be aware of is the existing natural substrate and the, the relative change between the hard substrate of the wind turbines and what you currently have. So some evidence, I'm just gonna quickly go through some of the, the different evidence that uh, is available. If you stick your head under the water at a wind turbine, you might like to get a picture like this, particularly in, in, in Europe, this kind of green picture that you can see. There is lots of, of fish type organisms there. And essentially we, we can see this. We know that there's gonna be association with the turbine towers, whether it's lattice or whether it's, it's gravity based, whether it's monopile, there's definitely an association. These are, can be small species of fish or they could be juvenile species of fish, which is important. In terms of actually understanding individual types of fish and how they utilize the, um, the uh, uh, turbine, wind turbines, there's some great evidence come from, uh, from Belgium looking at the uh, celebratory movements of, of Atlantic cod. And here you can see um, the hot spots, essentially the red of the, the color from going from orange to, to red is the, the more position fixes um, of the cod. And basically, you can see that those are two wind turbines that the cod are spending a lot of time hanging around. So this is acoustic telemetry showing that they move around, but they are associating with the turbine. And interestingly, this study also demonstrated there's a temporal nature to this in that a few months of the year, the, the cod will disappear from the wind farm to go to another area, not in the wind farm, but an adjacent the water body in an estuary, and then come back to the, to the wind turbines. Other interesting thing is we know um, that these organisms actually be eating some of the, the uh, fat, what you might call fouling or the colonizing organisms on the turbines as well. So some good stuff coming from, from our, our European colleagues. Again, all this evidence is not, is not work that, that uh, we've been doing it's just to see fat. This is work across as a collaborative work. And here's a great, the great picture which hopefully some of you have seen, which is the movement behind of hills around a wind farm are based on foraging or traveling. The red no, the red um, points are likelihood of foraging and the blue ones are traveling. 
So essentially what you've got is the movement pattern of the seal, the predator, is, is, is mapped out by the grid pattern of the turbine. So this is not a map of the turbines, this is a map of the movements of the seals, and it demonstrates that link. So we know that seals are using the areas as a foraging, uh, a foraging environment. Scaling up a bit more, evidence of, well, what, where, how, how do the fish associated with the turbines, where are they found? This is a study using seven different species, varying from very small gobies, some of the flatfish to cod. And what you can see is just that the cluster of, of points here is nearer to the turbine. We've got more of these species, and that's consistent. And this is a three-year so, uh, so, uh, study done in the, in the Baltic in Sweden. So that's interesting. We've got association, which tends to be nearer, again, correlates quite well with what uh, Jenny said about the, um, the local production at the turbine site. And then we've got um, some studies done, and, and uh, let's thank Lisa for at least the colleagues for doing this. This is looking at the effect change, the review of evidence base of the effect change of, of fit the fish community in relation to uh, a fit wind farm or not wind farm. And what you can see in this diagram is, is it's a relative effect size. So the further to the right, the more different the, um, um, the response is. And you can see overall, it tends to be a preference for the wind farms of the, 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 the studies that were shown by fish. Soft bottom and complex bottom species tend to be affected the most, whereas pelagics, not so much. But we do know that pelagic fish are found around the wind farms. If we think about from the trophic perspective, coming down to the bottom here, we've got functional feeding groups. So those that eat plankton, those that eat the benthos, those that eat, eat fish. And again, you can see that from the, for soft bottom communities, we've got all trophic levels are found around the wind farms and they are utilizing different um, um, food uh, sources available. And for complex bottoms, we've got a sort of uh, a, a, an association with piscivores coming in to feed on the fish and some of the planktivores, but not so much the preventables in the complex environment, which relates quite well to the, to the, if you've got hard bottom complex environment nearby, then why would you have your benthivorous fish going to, to the wind farm that, in terms of finding food? So some interesting stuff there. An even wider spatial scale. This is a, a study, again, done in the Southern North Sea, so cross boundaries, transboundary work, looking at flatfish. And we both think about the temporal scale. Here we've got on the left-hand side, six different species of flatfish, looking at the times when they're most likely to be spawning. So on the right-hand side here, we have the six different species that have the, um, their spawning grounds, and we overlaid that, so that's overlaid on with the uh, wind turbine uh, areas or the hatched red areas. So this is just about migration again, this is just a large scale, we have to be thinking about where the organisms are going and what they're using the environment for where the wind farms are going to be, because they may be present just for a short period of time. So that's, that's what that's about. Okay, so in terms of thinking about that, we need to understand that there's bigger scales. So, so what can we do in order to help that? Jenny mentioned this as well. And here's a, a really good example of how to try and do that using a, actually borrowed from social um, sciences is network analysis, connectivity. Uh, on the left hand side you see a picture of the, the North Sea and looking at the different colours are natural substrates that are linked. So they have hydrographic and biological connectivity that's been demonstrated. On the right hand side we have man-made structures, wind farms, shipwrecks, um, oil and gas platforms. And the strength, the colour that you can see, the, the greyness and the blackness indicates the strength of the connectivity. And this really just demonstrates, and this is a, this has got lots of, of assumptions in it, but basically demonstrates the need to be working at the scale that's appropriate to the organism they're interested in. Think about the ecological connectivity um, between the, the different points and thinking about the link to the natural substrate and the, and the initial connectivity there. Which is going to be important, particularly in the US, given you've got harder substrate compared to the soft substrate. Other things that we, we suggest that we need to be uh, thinking about when we're talking about the, the, the ecosystem and the, that kind of approach this assists with thinking about ecosystem approach to management. We currently look at species and habitats. There's a lot of work on conservation important species, designated species. We do a, quite a lot of focus on fisheries important species. We need to be thinking about ecologically important species, thinking about Jenny's Jenga as well. Bring that into a, the proper approach to think about ecosystem change. And one way to do this is a, 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 a 
paper that we produced not too long ago, which is trying to think about the different types of legislation and policy that we have but in, a, in an integrated system. So some of them will deal with certain parts of this. Some of them might be to do with conservation species, some might be fishery species, but we have to think about those in the round together. Life history is, is, is extremely important. And in the US, you, you, you've been leading this with essential fish habitat. And this diagram is really useful to demonstrate the kinds of data need at different levels to understand the importance of the, the fish habitat. So we may need to get to the higher levels in order to assist with the ecosystem understanding, the food web based understanding. So we have, we have, we have a legislative policy in place which can allow us to, to, to direct us down that route. And then we can bring in more integrated um, planning. I'm gonna move on now quickly because the, we're running out of time and because of the issues with my connectivity. Future considerations. There's a diagram just to think about. There's a lot of discussion at the moment in Europe and in other parts of the world thinking about utilising the areas where wind farms are for other things. This is the idea of coexistence and co-location. Trying to reduce the, the tension and the, the sort of potential for conflict and thinking about, we, we, we were made commitments, certainly in this part of the world, we've made a huge commitment to, to offshore wind. How are we going to do this by working with other stakeholders and not against and that's something obviously that is still a very, very topic to discuss, but it's something which is becoming more and more linked in. Now, policy is being, is, is being looked at to say, how can we encourage this or should we encourage that? Is it also to use the same space is a good thing? Can we be looking at uh, collaboration to enable that coexistence? And how can we do that in a way that's going to have less impact on the ecosystem and the food web? To improve the science evidence for ecological relevance and thinking about this, this, this food web aspect, we suggest that we need to be taking, get, collecting data, uh, basic monitoring that we get at the moment with different wind farms, but targeting research as well, thinking about cause and effect relations, something that, uh, that we've talked about in ICs quite a lot. Thinking about different trophic levels, the functional importance going on, and thinking about co-variables that might change what we're seeing. Now we need to be working across boundaries at a regional scale, possibly international scale, and collaborate and share data. Otherwise, we're never going to get the answers that we need for a understanding the changes within the, the trophic system. And with this, with this understanding, we can then use that to help support the growth of the development in the blue, uh, in, in, uh, blue growth and also recovery using the, the approaches of green economy growth um, to try and recover from the current situation that we've got. So we need to ensure that this is policy and legislative relevance and incorporates the, the needs and, and desires of the stakeholders. So we'd like to thank you all very much. Again, apologies for any, any issues with transmission. Um, we'd like to thank a lot of people across different disciplines, which have been fundamental to understanding where we are now. We've got a lot more to do. Um, and we'd like to, to, to thank the uh, uh, ICES working groups University of Rhode Island and uh, NOAA, and also some of the, the, the cross boundary and copy funding that occurred to provide some of the data for this presentation that we've Thank you very much. Thank you. Thanks, Andrew. Appreciate it. And um, thank you, Jenny, too. This is very um, interesting. Again, this will be recorded. Um, and um, we're going to go right to George. So, the, the way we're organizing the panel is we're, we've asked George and um, Dave Stevenson to um, interact with the panelists and have discussions. And then after uh, we spend some time with these guys, we will open it up to um, some of the questions that many of you are asking in the chat room. So please put your questions in the chat room. Thanks both of you for the, uh, the presentations. That was, that was really interesting. Um, one thing that, that stuck out to me uh, was something that uh, Jennifer touched on in her presentation that the blue muscle, the increase in blue muscles can actually drive down primary productivity um, of, of the area um, with those, those pelagic food, uh, that the pelagic food web relies on. And so, you know, given some of the concerns uh, we have, we're dealing with in Southern New England around, um, you know, pelagic fisheries for, for squids and forage fish, um, as well as uh, protected marine mammals. I'm just wondering, um, if that increase in production that you see in the benthos uh, corresponds to a, a decrease in the available resources for those, those pelagic 
species and uh, and what the scale of that effect might be given the scale of wind farm development that we're looking at here. Okay, first to, to primary production reduction um, of the phytoplankton reduction. This was a modeling study because primary production is not included in any monitoring studies in, in German waters, for example. So this is based on, on pumping rates of and the abundance of mussels on the, on the biomass um, of mussels. So there's no right, real proof that, that primary production is reduced. I know that there are some, some started and um, some projects started and they saw, for example, also hydrodynamic chains, so turbulences behind the wind farms, behind the turbines. Um, and I know that there are research programs going on. I know that there's a study from Belgium where they just had an experiment and looked at uh, filtration rates of mussels and, um, and the amphipods, for example. So all I want to say is that, that uh, there are no in situ measurements if this is uh, reduced by 8% or 5% or 1%, but it seems to be that there is a reduction. And this is, particular, this is then on a larger scale than just on the wind farm scale. Um, so I, the, so the, the question from you, if for the pelagic and, and, and the benthic, if, if we see differences, for example, for the pelagic fish, the thing is with the, with the turbines that you channel the energy in a different way. So instead of having a huge water column um, and the pelagic fish, you put now um, invertebrates in on the higher trophy and the eubotic zone, which used this new intertidal habitat that hasn't been there before, um, feeding not only on phytoplankton, but also, for example, on larvae um, from, 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 from benthic animals or pelagic animals. Um, but as far as I know, there are no studies kind of looking at what, what are the filtration rates of this, this biomass. Um, concerning the, 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 the balance between a pelagic and benthic production is kind of, that's the artificial reef effect that you concentrate energy flow to the structure, but there's no balancing um, studies, for example, and you can look at um, oil and gas rigs or artificial reefs, which balances what is, if it's concentrated on the turbines and missing in the pelagic. Um, I have read a lot of papers, but I didn't find any proof. So if any of them have one, that would be nice. Is that okay, George? Yeah, I, I think, uh, I, I think you, you got most of it. Thank you. Um, yeah, I, I'm just, uh, it's, it's an interesting, interesting thought. It, it just seems that if you know, if there's a certain amount of production that can be expected from a from a given area, if you shift that primary production into one sort of uh, portion of the food web, it, it would stand a reason that it would be you get a corresponding reduction in the other the other portion. I think, um, but I, I, if you could send me some of those papers from Belgium, I would really appreciate it. Yeah, Thanks. I think Jan is in the chat and can put it in the chat because he's on. Yeah, the paper. Jan just did that. Yeah, that's great. Yeah. Great. Thank you. One thing you have to have in mind, George, is when you think about reduction, it always depends on the natural surrounding. For example, the German bite is not limited in food supply, so there's no limitation in phytoplankton blooms or whatever. So it might mm. be different in, in other systems. So it doesn't it might not affect the pelagic zone in German waters, but it might be relevant for other regions, for example. So you can't compare if you have one outcome from one wind farm, for example. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, George, do you have one other question? Um, <clears throat> let's see. I, sorry, I wrote a bunch of notes. Um, oh, and I can go to David and then come back to you. So, David, Sure, that would be great. Thank you. Do you have a question, David? Yeah, I've been sitting here thinking about some of the differences in our situation here in the U.S., different than the, than the European situation. And a big one is we're not going to have, we're not going to exclude fishing from areas around the turbines. It may be harder for particularly larger vessels to get in there and trawl, but fishing is going to continue. And I was thinking, Andrew, about what you were saying about other uses, beneficial uses of wind farm areas for other purposes. And it strikes me that 
uh, recreational fishing is really going to benefit from the increased biomass around the turbines. And that, that if we in, embarked on some similar kind of analysis of, you know, energy, energy movement through the food web, we'd have to consider removals uh, by fishing in, in that. In fact, the recreational fishing would probably be very selective in removing fish like cod. Um, so it's, a, it's just another element. I don't know if you have a comment on that. Uh, yeah, no, you, you, you're right. There's going to be changes. I mean, the, the UK is different to the rest of, of Europe in that we still do allow fishing within the turbines. Um, although the, the, the fishing community, some will go in depending on the gear types they use and, and others don't. And they're, they're sort of waiting to see how that goes. But they, if they do go in, they'll go parallel to any cable routes. In terms of the, the recreational thing is, is um, from what is again, it's a kind of it's a nice question. There's lots. There's not that much known, but what we what we've seen is that some fish, recreational fishers say that there has been changes, and some say there hasn't, depending on the hmm. probably the species they're after. I mean, that's the thing they often target particular species. Um, and then again, it's going to be in com in com to what what the other existing areas are that you fish in, um, and so it's it's a bit of a kind of over here it seems to be whether some fishermen like the idea of wind farms, other ones saying, well, it doesn't really matter. It's not a better fishery for me, so I'm going to, I'm going to stay where I am. So I think the, like I said, the context is important. And I think in terms of, we tend to have that opinion more in the southwest of the, of the UK, so in the English Channel down to sort of France, which is less bounded and, and arguably probably less disturbed than the North Sea, where we probably have um, you know, a lot more uh, activity going on. Um, and so that might be more similar to the kind of situation that you have, because you're obviously not bounded on the on the east side because you've got the whole Atlantic Ocean. Um, so, but it'd be really interesting to understand. And the, the other point about understanding the changes that might occur for say recreational fishing or even commercial fishing is we need to understand this over time. So we know that the fish will come in, but again, we haven't got a good handle on are these fish communities gonna stay the same over time? I mean, the one study I showed you had three years of data, and it suggests that yes, they are. But we need to we need to understand that better because then you know we can't say oh there's going to be X number of this species of fish, and then five years down the line, we all we all know that fish will move around, fisheries move around. So there's that element we need to factor into our yeah. data collection. Yeah. Well, thank you. George, we're going to go back to George. Sure. Um, so given. Uh, given some of the potential shifts in, in productivity, have, has there been a corresponding shift in, um, in the, the gear types and fisheries that occur around wind farms? And along with that uh, potential shift in gears, ha have you seen um, more increased gear conflict on the edges of wind farms as those areas are, are sort of blocked off to different types of fishing? Uh, the fishing gear types didn't change. So, well, or, 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 as I know for, for, I know it for German waters. So it's mainly um, 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 beam trawl fishery and flatfish, and that hasn't changed. So it's, there's no change in, as far as I know, in active trawling gears, for example. And I know that there are some modeling studies from the fisheries uh, colleagues here, um, Vanessa Stelzenmüller, where they modeled the shift in fishery displacement or trawling, uh, trawling displacement. So if you have, and, and I think they're model scenarios with all the offshore wind farms in place, and that you will have higher fishing pressure by the beam trawlers outside of the wind farms, because the fishing fleet will stay the same, um, but the area that is available for trawling is less. So the fishing pressure they model will increase between the wind farms in a way. I don't know if, if um, I think that um, most wind farms in Germany, for example, the, the longest one is 10 years, but there are no long-term studies and there are not many studies, for example, on, on or no studies on pelagic fish and benthic fish there are. And I don't think that there's adaptation uh, to fishery. What, what I'm, I'm aware of or what I know is that they think about uh, eatable crab fishery with traps, with passive gear, because they increased tremendously. There's one publication from Roland Krone from 2017, 
Um, because if you put a stone or whatever in the German waters here, you will find an edible crab sitting there next to it. So they think about edible crab fishery and they also think about um, trying to, to uh, create new habitat for European lobsters and offshore wind farms. So that's kind of multi-use. But this is not active fishing here, but the passive fishing here. Can I just quickly add to that because Jenny's highlighted the difference there between the rest of Europe and the UK and that the modeling studies about fishing pressure are you you know you can expect more because they're not not allowed inside the wind farm whereas in the UK they are uh, but what's is tend, tended to be selective for those gears which which are, suit the kind of um, um, the availability of space so as Jenny just said we do have the passive gears things like the, the, the pots, the, the, uh, the creels, and also gill nets and things used within the wind farm in the UK waters, they have been used. So it, it's kind of been self-selective that the passive gears have, have been okay in that, in that regard. A small amount of, of, of small beam trawling, um, but again, that depends on the distance between the turbines, etc. Um, but again, there's a, there's a suggestion, and again, we haven't got the, the data, the decent data for this as well. We're only just collecting the data on things like vessel movement, and but there's certainly, interest in, in, in more fishing around the wind farm areas. But part of that idea, the ecological idea is spillover effect, but that's going to take time for that to occur, the spillover to, to be a true, a, a true sort of outcome of wind farms, um, rather, rather than being just a relocation of the fish from another area, so. Thank you. Um, and uh, so Lisa, I'm going to pass it over to you. This is, um, Lisa's, we've been talking about some of the questions are in the chat room. And so Lisa's going to answer or ask some of those questions um, for the, in the remaining time we have. Yeah, this, uh, one of the questions that came up in the chat box and it, it touches on uh, maybe uh, some of the things that uh, Jennifer presented and maybe just the last few words of your comments, Andrew, was the whole, um, you know, you're probably very familiar with the um, debate in the artificial reef literature on attraction and production. That is, you know, are, are the structures simply attracting um, animals and, and relocating them from other places, uh, or are they actually generating uh, new production, new biomass uh, in the system? And, you know, perhaps that's more straightforward to demonstrate for sessile invertebrate species attached um, compared to uh, mobile species, but I was wondering if you, either of you would want to weigh in on, on that topic and, um, you know, what some of the challenges are and, and what we might need to show to demonstrate uh, one versus the other. Should I ask that? Yeah, sorry, yeah, I thought it was at you first. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, I think for, 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 for the benthic invertebrates, for the lo lower trophic levels, it's really new production because there's, there's hard substrate available, there's fouling coming, so the lava will settle. You have first the um, bacterial uh, layer where the, the larvae settle on, the benthic larvae, and then you have real new production there. Um, because they are only, um, the, these, um, these species are only um, able to, to spread by dispersal, by lava dispersal, most of them, in a way. Um, concerning crabs, I'm not sure um, if this is production or attraction. So the, the, the numbers that we calculated mm, might argue for production, but we don't know if they are produced there or if, again, the energy flow or the, the, the populations are kind of attracted and, and the, the whole food web is kind of channeled um, in, the, in the first 100 meters of, of uh, the offshore turbine. So it's still on the debate, but it looks like for at least for the, the lower traffic levels, it seems real production. Andrew? Yeah, I mean, this is, this is a, a, a question that, you know, we don't have the answer for, but obviously it's something that we need to try and understand. And yeah, it touched on when you're talking about um, things like spillover, so the consequences of, of, of production or relocation. This is where we really have to understand the organisms we're working with and the scale that they operate at. This is where this idea of connectivity analysis and things come in and you can add to that genetic analysis to look at, at, at linkages. So the, the connectivity between the existing um, sources potentially of the species you're interested in and where that ends up. 
but also, and this is a great, this is the call for getting, for, for, for the targeted research we mentioned, is actually having a baseline question, which is, you know, what is the current state? Do we have an energy limited system, for instance? Jenny mentioned that in Germany that it's, it's not as energy limited. So what does that mean? Does that mean that if, there's, if there is a less mortality in a species that it can utilize that excess energy? That, that's the kind of questions that we need to be adding into this monitoring. So rather than just monitoring what you know what's there and its distribution as we have been doing it's actually thinking about the consequences if that happens and and jenny talked about primary production and the, 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 how you define the, the sort of productivity if we can bring in things like secondary production so looking at how the the higher trophic levels are utilizing that production um look you know it could be bringing in things like stable livestock analysis diet analysis and looking to see is there a difference between the productivity we see in our higher trophic levels between the wind farms and the, 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 the uh, adjacent habitats. Um, and and that, that, I think that's where we're going to get some, some mileage on this um, in order to help us understand whether it is a, a sort of sink source kind of idea. Uh, Lisa, do you have another question? Yeah, another question that uh, came up in the, in the uh, chat box. Um, was a question related to um, the challenges associated with uh, continuing scientific assessments uh, and surveys um, in the face of wind farm development. Um, and, and I know that's a, an issue that we're facing here in the U.S. because you know, we recognize that, um, you know, some of the surveys that we do will not be able to be conducted in the way they've been conducted for years. Uh, for example, um, the bottom trawl survey um, uses a, a stratified random statistical design and that you know design will be interrupted by uh, the placement of wind farms um, and so um, you know the, this disruption in the um, scientific assessment will you know increase uncertainty in our assessments of biological indices and um, you know we recognize that we need to adapt our monitoring um, across the region to be able to uh, make um, some uh, assessment of what's happening at these local wind farm scales versus the entire um, ecosystem. So I was wondering um, if Jennifer or Andrew, um, you're facing those challenges or thinking about those questions um, in, in your ecosystems and uh, what uh, what sort of uh, what sort of uh, things are going on related to that topic where you are. Yes, thank you, Andrew. Uh, the reason I just wanted to go first is, is that it's a, it's a really important question and actually ha um, harking to the, the ICES link here is the new working group, the Offshore Wind Development Fisheries Group, which Lisa you knew very well and obviously Andy's co-chair on. One of our questions is relating to that because it's recognised as a really important question. Uh, no matter which part of the world you're in, is, is, is that going to change? And what's quite amazing, and this is from a UK perspective, is that we have our standard fisheries techniques going on. We're having a complete new discussion, seeing as we're leaving Europe, or left Europe, should say, about our fisheries. And yet, our influence of things like these structures on the sampling programme doesn't really come up. I've, I've tried to have these discussions, and it's like, no, our current methodologies, we go out and sample these areas. So they essentially, I think they take the approach that if it's an area that can't be fished now, it's a bit like if we get put off by the weather or something. We've got a general sort of survey plan. We're going to get gaps in the data. That, you know, that's the, the nature of, of, of working at sea. But I don't think it's actually been understood clearly enough that there's more of these things going in the water. And as the map I showed, it is going to come in, it is going to get affected. So that's, that's really important. The other side was understanding pelagic fisheries, the understanding that within a wind farm is really difficult. And there's a discussion about what's the best method in order to collect suitable data for pelagic fish that we know either come into the wind farm occasionally or pass through. And I think this is where we can really work with the fishing community to find out, you know, what might be the best methods to use. Because, you know, we don't, we can't use some methods because they're just going to get caught up on, on the wind turbine. So there's no point in trying to collect the data if we're not going to get the information we need. So we need to be a bit innovative and have discussions around that. Great. Thank you. Um, so first of all, I want to thank all of our panelists uh, for doing what you're doing. It's really amazing. Um, 
and I, I know we just touched uh, the surface. So